Dave Portnoy. Yeah. So my audience is money, Bitcoin, global too, by the way. I checked the stats. I think 50% non-US. Nice. So they might not know you. So okay. for those that don't know, El Prez, Davey Page Views, creator of the internet. Yeah, self-proclaimed. One Bite Pizza Connoisseur. Yep. Uh, the Death Star to Business Insider. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to be. Many things, many things. You, I grew up on you, man. You're a lot of my generation's childhood, an absolute legend, and even more so after the last week, and the founder of Ballers Still Sports. So Correct. Thank you for coming on, man. We appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, no worries. All right. So for those that don't know, can you give a real quick TLDR on 20 years ago to today to catch us up on Barstool. You founded it uh, and then take us through the saga of Barstool, uh, Milton, Chernin, Penn, and then now back to you. Can you run sure. us through that? Yeah, I'll try to keep it brief. That's a lot of history there. So, uh, yeah, I st it started Barstool started as a newspaper in Boston. Uh, we're actually coming up our 20th birthday. So 20th anniversary, we're doing like an event for it in Boston next week, actually. Um, so it started like a gambling rag, like fantasy sports, um, gambling, and I'd hand it out outside of subway stations in Boston newspaper. I want to get involved in the gambling industry. And I called all like the offshore sports books, and they want to get off the internet at the time. Because during that era, if you went to like a gambling website, fireworks, bombs, planes, it looked like you're getting your credit card stolen. Mm -hmm. So like too cluttered, if you do a physical newspaper, we'll advertise in it. So I sold about a year's worth of advertising before it launched, like party poker, like the first advertiser. And um, actually went to like the World Series of Poker, the year Moneymaker won, and that whole boom with the people who developed the software. So that was 2004 to 2010. The newspaper era, we'll call it, where I'm just handing out papers every day, kind of doing everything, uh, start hiring writers, and we slowly expanded into other cities. Some of this could be a little bit off, but I think for the most part, it's right, like the time. And so Boston, like, picked up steam. So hold on, and I, this is a long story, so I want to interrupt yeah. a little bit. So I'm 29. Yeah. I founded a company. How old are you when you found Barcelona? About 25. 25. And yeah. you said, so that's a six-year time. So you're around my age now. Yeah. When you start hiring writers and scaling it up, was it just you? In the, in the beginning, it was just time? me. Yeah. Like I, so my newspaper. How are you paying bills? We had very little bills. But <laughs> I did. I, I sold, like I said, I sold a year's worth of advertising mm -hmm. before it launched. So I'd go to these gambling companies with this like concept. Um, so I was selling vaporware, basically. Uh -huh. It's like I showed them a mock. But I was able to get, you know, I think it was like party poker, 20 grand for the year, something like that. And they had a full page and I had Hooters on the back page for Boston. So, I mean, I had a sales background. So, and I started it as a business and I was just fucking pounding for advertising. I mean, early stories of the newspaper, it's like, you know, Morton Steakhouse. I'd put an ad for Morton Steakhouse in the newspaper. So like. Abe and Louis or a different steakhouse would be like, oh, we better advertise because we see our competitor. Mm -hmm. Instead, Morton's called me like, who the fuck put this mm -hmm. in the newspaper? Get it out of here. I'm like, oh, the sales guy, he, he's he's fired. <laughs> um, so <laughs> the early newspaper had like 10 different names in it, all me, like aliases, uh, like the marketing guy. Uh, Devilfish Dave was like some gambler. I just made up fucking names. So it appeared bigger than it mm -hmm. actually was. That a boy. Yep. So and you were 25, you graduated yeah. Michigan. Yeah. What were you doing before that? I had a sales job. So yeah, yeah I was like, uh, my first sales job was selling software for these Indian developers. They just put me in a room. I was like literally the only person who spoke English. They threw a uh, yellow pages, like the old school yellow pages, like just start calling people. I sold Mr. Tux, like this tuxedo place. They had the built the software for Mr. Tux. Um, so I did that. It was 20 grand. That was actually my salary. Like out of college, it was a joke. Um, <laughs> I did that a little bit. And then I moved to a company called Yankee Group like a year later. And that was research and consulting. A um, bunch of smart people. You sell access to the smart people centered around like wireless technologies and shit like that. Like Gartner Group, Forrester, Yankee Group. It was kind of that genre. Uh, so I did that for about four years and then started Barstool. Uh, knowing I want to do my own thing. Mm -hmm. Like I had a bunch of ideas. Barstool is what I landed on. I thought it was the most realistic for me to start. Um, and I never know because it's the only thing I've done. It worked. I probably got lucky in a lot of ways. But so it's the newspaper. And it started catching on in Boston. Like people would read it. It was very localized stories. Um, 
And it was just where it went from just sports and gambling to more pop culture, lifestyle, like bars. We started featuring like local girls from Boston. That was a big revolutionary shift for Barstool. Um, you know, Maxim was fucking huge at the time, but mm -hmm. Maxim were all these national girls. We started putting the cover of our issue was like a local bartender in Boston. Like we actually had this big, at one point, glossy magazine, like 25 sexiest bartenders in Boston. Like huge party, big local bar. You guys coined the term smoke show. Yeah, right? I invented that. I mean, dude, I grew up like, I, yeah, I, lot, school, I, like, that I don't get fucking smoke. credit for that. Wait, well, I'll get credit. Yeah, I'll yeah, get credit right you. now. Yeah. I use local that term to smoke this day. show of the day. That yeah. became a feature when we went to the web every day we had local smoke show of the day and people you didn't invent it trust me i did in that way because <laughs> i was a miami hurricane fan and i loved when they came out of the smoke out the orange bowl and that's how i pictured like a smoke show it's like bam she comes out of the comes out of smoke so that's where we got that's like what it means um and it just picked up people there's a lot of things I take credit for now. It's like, I invented that. People are like, what are you talking about? I was like, no, I like go find anybody using that word before we did. It was an everyday thing. And people just started calling girls smoke. Oh, she's smoke. So, um, yeah, that was, um, a big, big part. So that, that helped. We're a newspaper. We had the girls on the cover mm -hmm. and then we went to online and the online version started. I handed the newspaper out to a, a kid and because I was at the subway every day and he was moving to um, New York and he's like, I love this newspaper. If I build you a website, will you put the newspaper on the website so I can read it in New York? Get the fuck out he of actually here. ended up being the CTO for business insider, small world. Well, you want to talk full <laughs> circle. Um, he wasn't there when all this shit went down, but he was a smart kid and uh -huh. he built, he built the original website. His name was Ian white. And to his credit, he, he helped me throughout the early days. I'd be like, Oh, this is cool. Can I add this? Can I do this? He kept altering the website for free. Um, and that quickly is when I learned the future was online, not the newspaper. Mm -hmm. Cause while we we're growing through word of mouth with the newspaper, great. Once it's online, people would start sharing it. It was like, whoosh. um, in Boston, people led the charge. I'd start hearing, Oh, somebody in Chicago, LA. And it's like, how'd you find out about it? It's like my buddies from Boston. Mm -hmm. So I've often said like during that era, if you really want to be like, yeah, I'm from Boston. I know Boston. You wouldn't be like, Oh, Al Flack. Or you'd be like, I read Barstool. That was like, you were in the city and knew what was going on. It was like kind of a cult underground, very cool thing. And everyone in the city knew it. Um, so the online comes about more people find out about it. It's growing. And I'm like, I got something here in Boston and on the business side, it's like, maybe I can recreate it in other cities. And that's when we added, uh, New York, Philadelphia, Chicago. And a lot of the people are still sitting out there like mm -hmm. KFC, uh, big cat came in Smitty, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we got a lot of the cities and it really started to roll. It was the online era. Um, and that's like 2010 to 2016, where I would say we were one of the most well-kept secrets going. Like we were big and I knew we were big, but it's like either you loved us, or you hadn't heard of us. Um, so it, it almost became like that cult thing, except it grew outside of Boston. It was sort of like an underground edgy cult thing, I'd say in the United States. Churning Group comes in 2006, and, and we slowly fo uh, phase out the newspaper. I kept the newspaper only because my old school advertiser is crazy backwards as it is. I couldn't get paid unless I showed them a tear sheet from the newspaper because the internet, when I started, didn't really exist the way it does now. So they didn't have marketing budgets for online. They just had physical print and radio. And even though I knew they were getting results because I was posting, like if we did an event, Miller Lite didn't care that a thousand people showed up at the mm -hmm. event or how they showed up. They just cared. They showed up. They didn't know it was coming from the website, not the newspaper. And I couldn't get paid if I didn't show them their ad in the newspaper. So I kept that longer than it had to be. But slowly as the world changed, like, Oh, the internet, we got rid of the newspaper strictly online. Um, and I was doing well, we were making like, I probably didn't make money from 2004 to 2010 ish. 2010, we actually do our first music 
tour. Yeah, um, I remember. Was, that. It's called Stool of Palooza with Sammy Adams. Mm -hmm. So he's he, no one had heard of him at the time. I was in Boston. I was like, how do I get bar stool? We've never been outside the city. Let's see what it's like outside the city. Let's try to go to colleges. Um, we couldn't get our sponsors, which were mostly liquor, but unless we gave them a reason, something they could test. So music. We found Sammy Adams. He was a local guy. We did six shows. We just put it on sale. We were like, we'll go to UMass, UConn, Quinnipiac, which is like Toads, URI. Um, we did a Boston show, and we'll just see what happens. So we're doing it at like local bars and frats. We put the thing up. I got a call from the Mullen Center at UMass within 24 hours of us saying we're doing this mini tour. And they're like, uh, who are you? What are you doing? I'm like, well, who are you? What, what, what are you talking about? Like this, this <laughs> concert you put up that you're saying is at UMass, which was at just a little bar, like mm -hmm. 100. They're like, we're, we're getting calls off the hook, like tr people trying to buy tickets. And I'm like, oh, that's weird. They're like, would you ever do the show at our arena? I'm like, well, I, I don't know that we can. And they, they're like, I think you guys would sell ticks. I'm telling you, we're getting a lot of calls. It's like, fuck it. If you make the deal where I don't have to put much up, like, yeah, we'll give you the floor of the Mullen Center, which is 3,000 people, very little upfront cost. So we did that, sold out in like 20 seconds. And we went to also, we moved. We went to the arena at URI. We started going to the things, sold out, sold out, sold out instantly. And we showed up on these campuses and it was like the Beatles arrived. I mean, signs in the windows, people grabbing our chairs. Like that was probably the first time I was like, we have something right. way fucking bigger than I so, realized. So yeah. Okay. Cause eventually turn in and we'll get to that part, but what it was Barcel's moat? Like, so when you build a business, internet media is so saturated yep. because anyone can fucking do it. Right. I can go on and I can start blogging and then you've got ESPN and their moat is legacy and licensing and TV deals and more capital to outcompete guys like you back in the day, at least. Um, and then I, you got like business insider, you got influencers, but barstool time and time again, you guys somehow, and that part of your story to me is also as a business evolves is when you found your target customer yeah. is when you realize who your demographic was and then you would just sell, sell, sell yeah. to the college kids. And you then that's when I think you guys. Understood. Yeah. But what's the moat? Like so you're using the word moat I, to when I sold the churning group and people ask, what were they buying? They're buying the story. So like, yes, anyone can do the internet and things like that. We had giant head start. Because when we started, if you're like, what's a blog? People are like, I have mm. no fucking clue. Like we were, we didn't have the competition that is there now. We, if there was a funny story or something, I could sit on it for two weeks and do it two weeks later. And we'd still be the first to the internet. It didn't exist. And legacy media, ESPN, talk show radio, WEI being the perfect example of Boston. They were like, ah, these guys are just. It, bloggers are just people sitting in their basement. They paid no attention. It's almost like Bill Simmons. Bill Simmons at the time couldn't get a job at the Boston Globe. He like couldn't get like ESPN at the beginning. People didn't pay attention. It was an old school mentality in media. And this is not unique to me. It's almost any upstart industry. They just didn't pay attention. They were comfortable, fat, and lazy. Mm -hmm. And we were the exact opposite. And then once you let us get the momentum going, what differentiates us now is the story like i i've been through like fucking wars and mm -hmm. a lot of people have out there so we the credibility we bring to anything we do gives us sort of like a leg up and we're internet people we're born from the internet we um we're willing to try anything do anything i think it's allowed us to find like talent whether it be a caller daddy or like million dollars worth of game or whoever it may be where other people don't see it like how we see it but it's constantly evolving and changing uh, so and initially it's first mover advantage and now legacy yeah i think it's a combination of both and we still have maintained kind of that you know not always on purpose the we say pirate ship like mm -hmm. anti-establishment vibe not everything i can say here is planned out like we have a rivalry with the nfl that is priceless <laughs> like mm -hmm. i cannot put a price tag on how much Roger Goodell has done for us as a company by just refusing to acknowledge our existence. <laughs> like if he was just like, yeah, it's a joke. I'm done with it. That would hurt us. But he's such a fucking egotistical asshole. He can't even see it. So he drags me out of the Super Bowl and puts me in handcuffs. Like 
thank you, Roger. Like, that's the best <laughs> fucking thing that could ever happen. Like, I'm just sitting in my seat. Next thing you know, like, I'm the number one story at the NFL on the Super Bowl. I've hijacked your Super Bowl because you guys are fucking morons. So, um, and we've just had different incidents like that all throughout Barstool that keeps the edge, keeps, and, and it's the right people. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm an edgy Boston kind of jerky guy so oh, i think uh your genius if i had to describe your genius it's an ability to see yourself forward like the amount of like consistent intuitive decisions you've made over 20 years is remarkable i think that's what people look up to you i would argue that you you use the word funny i think what what does barstool sell i think you guys as a media business sell comedy more than an espn or anything and, and comedy is an addictive product to the general public. You were like a real world office in some ways. Uh, like- that's exactly right. That's exactly right. I, I think that that was a huge differentiator for you guys. And I think it's the best product that you have. And, and it's genuine. Like in people who know and follow it, sometimes the nicest thing someone can say about Barcelona is like they scripted that. It's like, who the fuck do you think is brilliant enough to script yeah. what just happened? It's yeah. like Larry David couldn't do that. Yeah. So, um, it's the land of misfits. And we get the stern comparison sometimes where he had his whack pack and it, maybe it is like a modern age that, but it's putting weird brains in a room and letting them be weird and cantankerous and fight and for all the good and all the bad kind of turning on the cameras yeah. and be like, here it is. Incredible. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank man. you. Um, all right. So I think people are here to, I assume to hear you and I talk about the whole pen saga. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you found this business Churnin comes in, buys 51%. Is Correct. that right? What yeah. was the valuation of the business? 12 and a half million. They, they took me no for a ride. No fucking yeah. way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did I you- did, so at that point, I knew nothing about, so I had no intentions of selling the business. And they took me for a ride a little bit on the pricing. Now, they were the right partner because they added credibility to let us do whatever they want. But like I would... If I knew what I know now, I would have jacked our fucking revenues up. <laughs> I could have made our revenues a hundred million if I want probably back then, but it was my money. Like mm-hmm. we weren't, I wasn't trying to bring in, I was just every penny I get gets mine or split. So our revenues, like I remember he, he compared us to, um, what's a fucking company, uh, bro Bible. No, was it bro Bible or one of the similars? Like their revenues are this. I'm like, yeah, but they're probably losing money. Like mm-hmm. we don't do that. So the 12 and a half was low. They all started at seven and a half. And they took 51%. Yep. Was there like, was there a board? There's, so they were just like controlling partners and and you s- trusted them. That yeah. You so would- the agreement was like, I have absolute final authority on content, um, but they wanted. What is that agreement? Of- like, was that in a contract? Like, yeah. Written, yes. Like yeah. a lawyer could protect that. Yes. Okay. Well, yes. Yeah. It was in the contract. Um, and, and to be honest, they never, not once. We're like, hey, you can't do this. Mm. Never. Well, I mean, they're a great partner. Yeah. I mean, look at the and, success since. Yeah. And they knew, like, Mike Kearns is who I met with. I knew he was serious because uh, he got connected to me through Jared Lorenzen, his agent, the old quarterback who RIP, great guy. Um, and I talked to him on the phone. He's like, can I meet with you? He's in San Francisco. I'm like, sure. It's like, all right, I'll be there tomorrow, mm-hmm. basically at noon. And he was. He got on a plane, did it. And he just listened. He was a big Barstool guy. I was going to say, sounds like a stool. He was. He used to be at Yahoo. So he ran like Yahoo Sports, had pitched us to them. They're like, what are you, crazy? Then when he went to churn in his first call, was like, let's see if we can do this deal with Barstool. And okay. they got a home run. And all right, so the money, uh, did that go to you? I got like three million of it to me. And the rest to the what? The business? Business, yeah. Okay, so it was like a half growth round like a venture round and half was like a secondary sale of the founder okay and that was 2016 yes and then you guys build that business from there on out just with that balance sheet correct so you didn't take any other outside capital nothing never that's fucking nuts and then then the pen deal so it goes so we we put they put their projections when we did the deal and they're like our exit we want to sell for 50 million that was the goal and within like two to three months we knew that we were going to blow past but all right from a business so after that deal how big is the balance sheet like five million dollars four million dollars what do you mean what's the balance sheet like what's your operating cash so you what do you build in the so you come to new york could you use churnin's books to like build off no yeah you you bootstrap the business with like five million bucks cash correct yes right yes so we hired erica see that was like 
basically what we knew we were doing. Okay, we're all relocating to New York pr prior to churning. I was in Boston. Dan was in Chicago. Um, Kevin was here. We're like, we're going to get an office in the city. We're all going to move and live in the city, and we need um, a CEO to run the business side. Uh, so that's where Erica came in. And honestly, it just fucking exploded. Mm -hmm. um, it certainly helps. Dan launched part of my take like almost instantly we had money so i would never hire like this he's like hey i got this guy pft i think me and him want to do a podcast go knock yourself out um but we didn't expand like we weren't like hiring new people all these people on payroll barstool was probably making two to three million bucks like before the churning deal so we we're making money in, in profit or revenue? yes profit wow yeah wow so it was like super profitable yeah. like people always want it's like i bought my nantucket house before yeah my first one before churning was involved like we were making money um and then so when they put the money in it was already a profitable business i think it was like five million six five whatever it is i think eight million total is what they put into the business if i'm not mistaken so i got three five went into like mm -hmm. the business account if i'm getting those numbers just, exactly just right support growth yeah. yeah right um but we never, yeah, we used that and things just exploded pretty quickly. And then You're making two to three a year, they try to buy it for seven and a half. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah. yeah, they yeah, got, got yeah, they got a great deal. Yeah. yeah. I learned that later on. Yeah. Whatever. It is what it is. And then when, when I always say happened? though, no one else was fucking asking me for deals. Like people always say that to me. They're like, you got taken. You could have done this. It's like, listen. That they was were the, the old, deal. We had one offer. Yeah. That was it. And then we negotiated, we got up, but they weren't competing versus anybody else. He, as we go down the story, neither was Penn when they bought us. Yeah. So, okay. So 2016, business explodes, numbers go up, and then Penn comes, and the number that's on the internet is 550, right? Or Right. So what happened with that? Well, the rules in the United States changed that allowed sports gambling. Great for us, our origin gambling company. Um, like I helped build. DraftKings and fucking FanDuel. I was like mm -hmm. their number one advertiser for a long time. So that's great. Um, so the deal with Penn, they originally bought 35% of the company and the valuation was 450 million. Then they bought the remaining 65 at a valuation of like 650 million. So I think if you look at the like whole pie, blended. it comes around, the blend is around five, why that deal structure what what do you buy uh, when you buy a third of barstool sports what are you buying was the intent to always purchase out intent was always to buy it outright but and you guys probably negotiated the terms that you wanted to yeah grow into a higher it, valuation it, well no not really that i think like the negotiation was pretty simple there wasn't much back and forth i think we named our price they accepted it the terms it was more so which we certainly figured out later on in this deal they weren't ready to be like, we just bought Barstool Holy and have the regulators and people be like, what the fuck are you doing? This was put your toes in the water a little bit. And then you can still say if like a regulator or a mass commission is like, what are you guys doing with Barstool? It's like, we don't, they still are, we don't own them. Churning owns them. Well, all right. I, I run a highly regulated business mm -hmm. and I'm not as public enemy number one on the internet as you are, but I'm a little out of my fucking mind. I mean, I went to El Salvador and advised a rule change that like combats the IMF and regulators don't in my industry, money transmission regulators don't. I mean, I don't know if I'm going to get us in trouble, but you pass your audits, you comply, you follow the rules and yeah, they just want to know what you're up to. Be informed, right. Stay helpful. So is it not our industry? What the fuck is that? What is gambling well, not your regulator? industry or not? the name not the brand right like both whatever the case may be we right. were not traded fairly you uh, there there's literally like if you want there's a gambling commission um when they have their hearings they got to be like recorded they're public and there's one particular where there's a woman on the committee basically bring up everything as me and barstool and there's other people on the committee literally being like i want this on the record that they're being treated unfairly that there's no what you're doing you haven't done for anybody mm -hmm. else and it's unfair and i just want it like on the record i mean it, it's they hated me going in they hated me going out and i don't know how your money commissions work but these people have no oversight 
They're not elected officials. They're appointed officials. They answer to nobody. I mean, the fines they give out, like the can't lose parlay, like we were got fined for that. Mm -hmm. Dan's been doing that forever. Mm -hmm. Anybody with any common sense knows if you call something a gimmick, can't lose parlay, the games haven't started. You can fucking lose. We did that for years. We never had one complaint. Not one person bet that and was like, hey, you said I couldn't lose. None. Fine for doing that. Can't do that. We um, got fined half a million dollars for being uh, on Toledo's campus doing a game day show. We're told we do a college game day show for football. We go to campuses. It's a college football. We're told we can't do that. Only us. ESPN does college game day. That was going to be my next question. Uh, there's so much political lobbying in the world, but I mean, getting into Bitcoin and stuff and the SEC and ETFs um, to see senators just flip their opinion like, oh, someone got in her pocket. And then you realize it was scumbag drug addict SBF. Or yeah, whatever. right. Yeah, right. So I always wondered too, watching you guys get treated unfairly is that would you ever speculate tinfoil hat that like DraftKings or ESPN no. would pay a regulator? No. So these people just don't like the, your pizza reviews? So no, they don't. Listen. There's <laughs> the fuck is well, well, if you don't, if I went and Googled myself and read a lot of the negative articles about myself and read those and like, this is true. Like what business insider wrote is true. I would think I'm Hitler. So a lot of these, whether they're chose not to be educated on myself, the whole subject, but they came in with a preconceived notion that I was Hitler mm -hmm. and you know, I'm a lightning rod for a lot of like it's politics mm -hmm. i like politics break people's brains and i don't consider myself political to be honest but i'm seen as political by a lot of things and it's just you know it, it they wanted no part of me All no right. part of me so i want to so for pen the way i thought about pen i have gambling infrastructure i don't know shit about your industry but i have infrastructure where i have brick and mortar i have a big balance sheet uh i have this is what I don't get because you guys were trying to get licenses, but I have I have something, but I don't have distribution. And my interest in Barstool is brand association and distribution to retailers because we're now excited about like consumer gambling and mm -hmm. the fact that that's legal in apps. And so that was their relationship. Did the or their interest in the deal? Is that correct? Like, yeah, they had they had the it? licenses. Oh, um, they did. Oh, but yeah. you needed more. You well, well. So, so Penn is the biggest like regional gambling company. Like there's a lot of casinos. You may not even know they're Penn. They, they had a ton. So with the casinos, a lot of times you are granted licenses because if you have an operating casino in a state, you already get it. Others, you got to apply for it. Like we didn't get a license in New York. Mm -hmm. If you read the newspapers, it says that's because of me, mm -hmm. like that they, you know, thought I was a bad for the brand or what, or the state or not a good look. Um, other places like Massachusetts, they get a license because they had a uh, Plainville, like, but they had to fight tooth and nail. It was a temporary license and the commission said they were going to investigate mm -hmm. parcel sports. Why? Who knows? So basically Penn knew they had access to a lot of these online licenses, but they didn't have a brand that anybody knew who it was yeah. or cared about. So the original thoughts, Hey, we're going to have online gambling. You got to remember the laws just changed. So it was kind of new, mm -hmm. um, but we're going to have access to all these licenses for online gambling. We have the casinos barstools, this big brand, let's marry it, name it barstool sports book. Penn is underneath it and mm -hmm. owns it and gets all the finances. So that was the concept. Okay. And the, what, was capital vested right away. So it was a cash stock deal. Yep. A, a little of both. And so they put 500 some odd million, if you blend it all together, into you guys with the upside being we're going to get this license uh, together with our infrastructure and Barcel's brand and distribution to the consumer. We're going to outcompete DraftKings. We're going to outcompete FanDuel. We're going yeah. to take over an emerging industry in gambling. At least, I don't know, take over, but be top three. Yeah. yeah. All right. And it, it didn't work. Correct. Because regulators don't like you. And what about, was there any like execute? Because if I'm, so then to finish the story for the audience, then Penn reinvents this strategy with ESPN, yep. learning from their mistakes, a more mature brand, getting in bed with Disney. They've got the money and the capital and the lobbying to, to get what they need to do to realize what they think is a good idea. And they give you back the business. 
What I don't like is that five hundred million dollars wasted. Is someone at Penn about to get fired? Or no, the board's got to be pissed. Uh, well, it's a combo. They still have our base, which I think. What does that mean? I mean like the people who use Barcelona Sportsbook. Like Barcelona Sportsbook, as we record this, has not flipped to ESPN bets. You can still do Barcelona mm. Sportsbook, and in some states, I think it's ten percent. We have like a, a Pennsylvania, maybe a little less now. So that. It's very hard to get that. Like I, we still, like if Penn didn't have the Barcel name on it and they did this, they'd have zero. So they still have all these people. Mm. And if you look, I think it's like I don't know. I don't know the like mass. Maybe it was twenty twenty million dollars. So this gambled. is like a customer acquisition play that you're arguing now. Well, they yeah, and and the amount of advertising and spending that goes on in the industry. If they didn't have us, they would have spent most likely 500 million mm -hmm. to acquire that audience they got with us anyways. So um, it's not like they have, they don't have nothing. Now where I think both we agree, Penn and us, we're light years behind on technology. Light we years. talked about that when I, when I met you for the first time, I was like, I like if I, if I were an outside investor, the qualms I would have or the hesitancy I would have to just go long pen barstool is yes. Like I don't understand the regulatory landscape, but then also like, do I believe this is also a technology play? It's big time technology. And do I believe like, I know Dave isn't managing engineers. No, I got no idea. So, of course. <laughs> so, but they bought a company called the score, which is spent about two years building what is Penn's answer to the technology. It just flipped. So ESPN bets will be using that technology, mm -hmm. which is a huge improvement. Mm -hmm. So I think kind of, I don't know everything that was Penn was thinking, but it's like, all right, we got this brand new technology that we just invested a shit ton. And we have this opportunity with ESPN. Um, that is a gigantic, gigantic brain, uh, brand. We already have the Barstool crowd which we've gotten i think part partly why i keep saying it's a win-win people who know me like i'm i have pen stock i'm rooting for pen mm -hmm. i want this to work i don't think they want to be in a situation either where it's like barstool suddenly unhappy with pen because all this goodwill that you built up is out the window so it worked out for everybody mm -hmm. it, it it truly was a win-win and Nobody's rooting harder for the ESPN bets app to kill it because mm -hmm. I'll make a fucking lot of money. Of course. All right. So wait, so uh ESPN bet, it's not simply like a reskinning of the same app. You're saying the tech stack, like it'll it'll feel well, the like app, the app just I haven't seen what it's gonna look like. Cause I know they said it's gonna launch in fall. It's August. Correct. It'll kick off is soon. Correct. They just launched soft launch the new app so it yeah. is very different than what we were using with um and in fact jay snowden the ceo for a lot he's like we kind of pulled back the barstool advertising because we knew our app had fallen behind mm -hmm. it's like do we really want to advertise and really go nuts to push people to what we think is inferior like a app? Bad experience yeah so this score app which was built and will be esp bets has been like two years in the work so it is a totally new app that again i haven't i'm not part of that right now so but it's designed to be a much better user experience sticky and deliver better results better everything from better lines like it used to be we had to go through a third party can be their lines stuck now like we have our own lines so that's that's the pitch at least everyone today is a software company yeah, I don't think we're people not. generally appreciate that. Well, not anymore. Yeah, you you were a month ago. Or yeah, whatever. well, we were never doing that. We never had anything to do with the tech. But you, your performance was Penn's market cap and share price, right? And the tech sounds like it sucked. And yeah, totally. They were they were right. They were dependent. Also, like when you, it wasn't just regulatory, like with the stuff that Penn had to deal with, like Business Insider twice. No, oh, totally. Twice dropped on the day before earnings. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's also when anybody with a brain is like, this isn't just a normal thing going on. You don't you think don't... that was a coincidence? Yeah, twice, <laughs> twice before earnings. It's insane. Well, yeah, man. I mean, like did, that's just insane. Did you see what happened to Dorsey and Block? I mean, this is just the media is ridiculous. Markets are rigged. 
uh, there was a story that came out before earnings where a company built a report that accused Dorsey of all sorts of fraud and chargebacks in cash app and in his business and then they just put a giant short position on yeah you know, that's it's tra- crazy it's ridiculous you should it's be ridiculous. in jail for that yeah i mean i agree and, and even with when that happened with us like some of the you know deep deep web or whatever you want to call them but the financials are like you should look into who just fucking shorted you guys like the night before because yeah. that's crazy yeah and uh, fucking blodgett is a guy who got kicked fucking off the stock market for Criminal. being a fucking scumbag and telling his clients that they should buy a stock while probably <laughs> privately saying he sucks. So the guy who runs <laughs> this magazine, this website has literally been banned from the stock market and releases an article on the day before earnings twice. And nobody in the normal media is talking about that. It's because they don't like me. Business insider. This is a true story interviewed me i think it was august of last year about sam bankman freed sam bankman freed had came out and said a bunch of horse shit i've been in bitcoin for it's my 11th year so i know how the thing fucking works sbf comes out says the most load of horse shit full of lies and i tweeted about it and said this kid's a fucking criminal this kid's a liar They do an interview with me, 45 minutes, where I break down that he's a liar. They won't release it. So this this little college kid is like, my boss said I can't publish it. I'm like, why? It's like, it's against against our policy, against our rules. We can't talk about Sam like that. Yeah, right. That they they have shit like that. And November comes, FTX is a big fraud. Everyone gets fucked. I wish people could have heard what I had to say. I was trying to throw red flags. And then we learn after that that he was paying them to not publish uh, bad shit about him. So those guys are political criminals. Even even the list of like the the money he gave to like politicians is fucking disgusting. Yeah, but Business Insider's a piece of shit. All right, so um, you found it. You hustle to turn in profitable business, seven figures a year of cash flow. I mean, that's that's fucking nuts. Um, Grow it to the pen deal. Pen, this vision that pen has isn't going to be realized. Combination of regulatory, technology, maybe a little ahead of their skis. Also, we were in this Davy day trader bull market stocks only go up. Cash yep. was free. You try anything. Cause why not? And this is one of the things that isn't working. They got to dial back. So they want to get in bed with ESPN. So then the last chapter of this is they give you back barstool, which I am trying to figure out the financials, but now at this point, hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue worth hundreds of millions of dollars in an acquisition deal of recently, they give it back to you for $1 yes. and you vest all of your pen shares are now liquid yep. and in your pocket and you own now you own a hundred percent controlling stake of the entire thing that you originally founded. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. All right. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. I, I got <laughs> but I got to ask a ton of questions. Um, first of all, what did you acquire for a dollar? Like what? So obviously the shares in this entity. So you probably had to like restructure the entity and give you all the controlling shares and you own a hundred percent of it. But what is on like the balance sheet? Like did Barstool have assets and like cash? Like no. you don't have a dollar in the business bank account. No, do no you? we don't. We don't. Right. We don't have assets and we're losing money. Right. Okay. That was going to be my question. So if, like I'm reading this and I'm like, I've, I've been a stoolie since I was a fucking kid. I love Dave. I'm happy for Barstool watching the stool scenes and everyone's going nuts yep. and throwing parties or probably weren't in the office the next day. Cause they're all yeah, probably right, hung yeah. over probably. probably just bad work. Yeah. Just, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm pumped, but as a businessman, I'm like, all right, what did he buy for a dollar? Cause I also know you get in bed with a big balance sheet and you probably over hire culture gets a little messed up. The sales team probably is, is different than the content creators and people clash and there's moat bloat everywhere and you lose profitability and you're in Miami and Montauk and a lot of the edge and, and the innovation in the business over the last 20 years is on his way out. And then for a dollar, I'm like, are you, did you acquire a business that needs to reseek profitability? Like, are you going to can a lot of these motherfuckers yeah so you, you're pretty much on it um everything you said about we probably we went in the dave portnoy era uh it's like profitability profitability mm-hmm. profitability churning 
The goal was already to sell it. Pen, it's big, huge funnel. And if just a fraction of that funnel will gamble, it, we yeah. don't care. We don't care if like what happens there. We are now back to pro. I'm going to get this thing. I don't even know about profitable. Um, break even. Yeah. Like if I can get it to break even, I'm very happy. Uh, and yes, I'm going to have to bring back, like I had a sales meeting up there and I'm pretty sure it was different than any sales meeting they had because I'm like, I don't want to, it was like Wolf of Wall Street. Type. I'm like, look around. I had like half of these, you motherfuckers aren't going to be here. Mm -hmm. Now, our comp plans were fucked up. I looked at them, a sales background. I said that's like, I want people making a lot of money in this room. I don't want people being happy with bases. But yes, we're bloated. We're going to get rid of that. That doesn't mean, listen, if everyone proves like there's a kick in the ass and all of a sudden everyone that sales floor or wherever is killing it, then we don't have to get rid of anybody. But we're going to get this thing back to where it's making money. And I think that is not going to be overly difficult. What? What may, I mean, I believe you, but why do you feel that way? Just because you believe in the business? I believe in the business and I You've like seen it before. Yeah. Well, it, we still have me. We still have PMT. It's like the normal sports cast. We have uh million dollars worth game Boston. We still have extreme talent. Our revenues, I think are like 200 million. Like we're bringing in like 200 million. It's incredible. So it's a good business. It's we're fucking just spending like assholes. So, Hey, and who knows what it'll be, but Arizona Bowl, you're cute. Let's do it. It's good. Penn wants us to be out there. College basketball, buying rights. Yeah. These are million-dollar things we're doing. We don't really give a fuck if we're making money. I mean, we want to, but who cares? So I looked. It's like, oh, cut here, here. Boom, boom, boom. We're right back to where we need to be. And do you have, like, a another thing I was talking to him on the flight is, like, does Portnoy have a CFO? Because shaping up this business yes. is going to be a lot. Yeah, so I'm sure Erica. So Ada, was the deal so like you got to find your own bank accounts, find your own pay, uh, payroll providers, uh, do a lot of auditing, no, financial? No, it's pretty good transition. And yeah. Eric already knew everything that was going on Over with the business. Over how long? Because the world heard about it, what, a week ago? Yeah, we only knew about it for like three weeks. Jesus oh, Christ. It all happened really quick. Yeah, it was Jesus. very fast. Um, so, but Erica has a great handle on the business. So like, obviously I wasn't like, all right, I'll take it back. And, and I'm fucked. I knew pretty good where we stood. And the, the accusation, did you get cash? Like, how are you operating the business? It's, uh, is there cash in the bank? There account? was a little bit, there's enough to keep like payroll and stuff, but we'll be able to turn around. And if I have to like, make sure we make payroll for a couple months, I'm fine doing that. Mm -hmm. Like I, mm -hmm a shit ton of money yeah so and that your personal position is i made my payday yep i can live the life i want to live because you were kind of i follow everything you say you were kind of in more or less words like two years from now yes i'm out of here and now it's you sound like you just founded the place again yeah so a lot of what i thought about when i was thinking all right dave you'll be out of here in two years and whether you're still associated doing little stuff, but you're going to fuck off into the sunset. When this new ESPN deal came with Penn, they have a gigantic new media partner. The reliance on Barstool, not nearly as much for Penn and Penn's investing a lot in ESPN. And I say this, it's kind of funny, but it's, it's actually true. I got a lot of fuck idiots out there. Mm -hmm. Nate dog. He's a fucking idiot. What's he going to do if he's <laughs> not part of here? the product? Smitty. What's he going to fucking do if he's not here? And I fucking hate Smitty. He should be fired anyways. But there's <laughs> other people I don't hate. Glenny balls. Like they've been with me for almost two decades mm -hmm. to me. And it was never said the writing was on the wall. If I just fuck off, Penn has this deal with ESPN PMT, Dan, he's set like people are always going to need him. But that's not the DNA of Barstool. We have a lot of fucking romper room fools out there who have been with me again for a long time. And to me, I wasn't comfortable being like, all right, see you guys. Good luck. What are they going to go fucking bag groceries? Like nothing wrong with bagging groceries. But I felt if I got back involved, I could turn this thing around to get it to break even profit, whatever, not ton. And these guys would have their jobs for another 10, 15, 20 years. That's how I looked at it. So it, it, that was the choice in my mind, man of the people. It did watching you over the last week. It did read to me like 
you care. Like you always 100%. have cared. Yeah. I, I'm not a, like an attaboy guy, but I'm loyal to like a fault to yeah. my people. I, and I would even say not only the people here in the office, but to stoolies. Yeah. Like you talk openly about these people when Business Insider puts something up, like these people go to war for you. They do. And they do. Uh, I also don't think you wanted to like let them down either probably. Yeah. Like, like I said, I, I, when it was just pen and bar stool, I was far more comfortable with like, yeah, pen will, uh, bar stool will continue on because pen needed bar stool. It wasn't, it yeah, wasn't your yeah. job. Right. Yeah. 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 And like, all right, it's set up and it's going to go, but bring in another gigantic media. And I know we're losing money. It's like, if I was in pen shoes and we're still losing money and ESPN's cranking, it's like, what do I need these guys for? You know? So that was a, that was definitely a thought. On the revenue side, just doing some research, reading through the 10 K, I obviously don't have the specific language of what the non-compete entails. But one thing that I was curious about, or at least that I think that other people might be concerned about, I'm curious your opinion on it, obviously. Um, are you allowed to promote any other? No, not right now. We do have a non-compete. I don't even know I'm legally allowed to say how long it is, but people certainly know when it's over. One thing I have heard, or a lot of people say- Because like, that gaming revenue is just gone then, but, right? It's right, not- right. But people have been saying that, but we didn't have gaming revenue. Like we haven't had <laughs> gaming revenue since we've been involved with Penn. Like we weren't allowed to take gaming re- revenue because that's why they bought us. So mm-hmm. Penn has owed us for three years. Our 200 million has zero dollars of gambling revenue because Penn didn't pay us. So yeah. I keep saying, seeing that as like, how are they going to survive without gambling revenue? We haven't fucking had gambling revenue since Penn took over. Mm. Yeah. I mean, $200 million of revenue annually is a, that's a big business. You guys will be fine. Right. That's, like, that's, fine. there's levers like, and it, so it's 200 million, I think, about that number. And I got to cut like cost by 12 million over the course of a year. Like that's in that scheme of a number that's not to me overly difficult that is insane though that you get handed a business that big with like not a lot of runway you acquire it for a dollar and then you gotta you kind of like come out of quasi retirement and gotta figure it out yeah because you're a man of the people that's a good story that's fucking nuts it's crazy that's it's fucking crazy like I, it, it, the craziest part is like, I didn't see it really coming. Like I was, it, it like happened really quick. Everyone is, is speculating on, cause you love your net worth and, and uh, <laughs> yeah. celebrity net worth and everyone's speculating on it. I've seen people say billionaire, lose money. I've seen it all. Well, at two, $200 million annual revenue from what I know, and the audience can take it for what it's worth. If you were a tech business, if you were in my industry, depending on the market, you, you'd trade at five to 10 five X, 10 X multiple. So you'd be billion, $2 billion business probably. And in, in a bull market, God knows. Yeah. I um, mean, we're, te- I wish we were a tech company. We're not right. So I don't know how to price I, a that, comedy I'm sure, media brand on the internet. Right. And I think people look at that, like we're very <laughs> yeah. like, what happens if I just one day I'm like, you know what? I'm tired of this. I'm mm-hmm. out. Dan's like, Hey, guess what? I'm tired of this. I'm out. KFC is like, you know, I got my kids. I'm old. And you, you know, five to seven people leave. What do you got? That's the question. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know how to price it, but either way, I mean, huge. So I want to transition. What I'm curious about, you are extremely wealthy personally. And now this business, I mean, that's a big business. This is one of the most interesting times in financial markets ever. You did the Davy Day tra- Trader, mm-hmm. stocks only go up. It was fucking hilarious because it resonated with people like me that actually are pissed that stocks only go up. Um, and now stocks only go down. And we need to go back up. Fast, fastest <laughs> interest rate hike ever. Um, how much of this stuff do you pay attention to? Like if I had to manage a business and a balance sheet this big and speculate on the future of how much runway I need versus like growth versus cash profitability. Like you seem like a simple man. Do you think about any of like the outside market or is that Erica's job? No, I plan on it down the road. If we became profitable, like investing Barcelona's money, like I loved like when Elon bit uh, like bought Bitcoin, I tried to get us to do it. I was like, I think we should do that. Like make money quick. Um, so you're still a Bitcoin guy. I still have all my Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah. That was the biggest thing when I, uh, the tweeted. only I sold one just when, <laughs> um, 
like all that shit was going FTX. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I gotta make sure this shit's like liquid and I can get in and out of, I'm in with the Winkle bosses. That's who I use. Well, yeah, we'll talk about it in a sec. I I'm curious uh, how you guys manage the market. And then I want to talk about Bitcoin. Yeah. But just before we move on, what, what do you like, how do you manage your personal wealth and Barstool now in this market? Like, is that your your job yeah. that's a that's in like no cfo right now on planet earth is comfortable and all of a sudden you get handed a fucking potentially yeah. billion dollar business like <laughs> yeah i mean i i guess i haven't given like i plan on probably managing it with like the people who've been helping me manage my personal so you got wealth. like a team yeah yeah, yeah. yeah okay. exactly okay Okay. Well, you personally have Bitcoin. Let's get some Bitcoin on the balance sheet for Barstool. That's I, I like I said. I literally tried to convince Jay to do it <laughs> back in the day. It was then I couldn't. I I could see us definitely having Bitcoin on the balance sheet well, in the future. Fun. Are you you still hold a uh, Safe Moon? Yeah, I'm like for I don't know what it's fucking worth. I mean, I got sued for that. <laughs> well, what's I got out of the lawsuit. They, they fucking sued me. I was part of this class action lawsuit. They were saying, because I think actual celebrities did get paid to promote Safe Moon and didn't disclose, like, I'm being paid to do it. Not me. I, like, picked one out of a hat, and I went on a YouTube, and I'm like, I don't know the fucking first thing about it. Could be a scam. I'm just picking one, because, and here's what it is, Safe Moon. But I got served, and my I had to, it cost me probably, like, 30 grand just to get off the lawsuit. They're like, look, he, he, they went through everything. I never got paid for it. I fucking trash safe move more than anybody else. But I was very clear, like, you when were. I said it. So. so I think this is a bit of a layup for a classic rant and just differentiating the, the, between the two of Bitcoin and something like a safe moon. But how, how the fuck does a token sue you? It was a class action lawsuit. It was people who, um, it was people who bought the safe moon. Oh, got it. Yeah. When we were talking in Miami, didn't the marketing team call you or something? The like marketing that? team got mad at me <laughs> because the at the, the Bitcoin team? conference, I said "fuck safe moon," <laughs> and they were like, "Please don't do that." Well, you know these. It things, was like from John at Safe Moon. Have you been following uh, all these tokens and the John trouble they're safe. getting in in the SEC? Not, not a ton. Well, these I things mean, it doesn't fucking surprise me because I, I like, they're scams. I mean, the fact that. They're violating securities law. Securities law in America is created to protect ethics. I can't create Jack Bucks and tell Justin Bieber to convince a bunch of 20 year olds that right. it's really cool. That's unethical and immoral and fraudulent. And so you have securities law. And that's what people do, though, is that I create Safe Moon and I actually have a marketing team. It's not decentralized or anything. And I pay Portnoy to. Yeah, that's like what Kardashian got in trouble. Yeah. For. Yeah. All right. What's your, but what's your Bitcoin story? So when I met you in Miami, uh, was that a year and a half ago or something? Yeah. You were at, so all, all my audience, I'm like, I'm going to talk to Prez. They're like, tell that paper hands, pussy fucking, uh, yeah, I get the paper hands a lot. So <laughs> what, the, the yeah. Bitcoin, what happened? <laughs> I, it was COVID <laughs> times. I was, didn't know what the fuck Bitcoin was. I was in the Hamptons staying at Gurney's. Just so happened, the Winklevoss twins were like staying a door down from me. I had bought, I had bought um, Bitcoin. It was eleven thousand. I bought it. They heard I bought it. They're like, "Let us explain it to you." They came over to my apartment or what I was renting, and they explained Bitcoin. It was fucking cockamamie. What they explained to me was like Elon Musk was going to fly to outer space. And mine Bitcoin from the sky or gold from the sky is going to rain plentiful. And I'm like, are you guys fucking serious? And like, yeah, it was the video is out there. Yeah, it's like gold from ash. Yeah, I'm like, this is fucking crazy. Like gold's not the second they left. I was like, sell, like because I'm like these fuckers. I don't want no part. I don't know what they just said, but I want no part of it. Within two days, three days, a week, we'll have to look at the timing. Is when Bitcoin went on the run. It went Mm -hmm. from like eleven of. 20 to 30 to 40 to 50. Yeah, you got killed. And I'm just sitting there like these fucking fucks. Like I sold it. I bought sold at the same price. Um, And then I started learning more about it and what it was. And uh, I rebought it at 32. Like 
around there. Like it was 50 and it kind of went down to 32. And that's my entry point now. And I think I have like 10 of them or something like that. You bought, yeah. You, well, I think you said you bought a million bucks. Yeah, I did a million bucks. That was your yeah, position yeah, yeah. size. Yes, correct. And we're yeah. at like same price range yeah. right now. Do you, un do you understand it now? Hmm. Mm. so here's a funny story we i i my official statement i think it's too big to fail that's what i i think enough people are involved in it where i think i don't necessarily buy into the original reasons for why it was created but i now believe in it this is why what i want to argue about so i wake up to a t I'm a stoolie my whole life. I wake up to a text and I've met Saquon Barkley and Jack Dorsey and presidents of countries. I wake up from a text from Dave Portnoy and I, that was like the most like excited I'd been my whole career. Like Dave Portnoy wants to get lunch. Like, Let's fucking go. I go to lunch. You're like, you're a Bitcoin guy. Why are you a Bitcoin guy? I'm like, well, I think it's probably the most asymmetric opportunity of my life. Uh, it's probably the most exciting innovation technically of my life. And I get to help the world. And you go, that's bullshit. I hate when Bitcoiners <laughs> do that. You don't want to help shit. You yeah, just want to make my... money. And I'm sitting here like, fuck you. I can't help <laughs> oh, the you, world. You, you were also like, yeah, making money is a thing. That is one of my <laughs> oh, that is one of my tenants that the Bitcoin people are all, like, I feel like 99 is like, we're not doing this to make money. We're doing it to help the world. It's like, fuck that. You're, you're doing it just like everybody else to make money. I do believe that. Yeah, you and I, if you refuse... So, because I don't think you really care to understand it. And every time anyone's like, no, if you take a second, it could actually do a lot for human flourishing and equality and inclusion. And you're like, fuck you. I don't disagree <laughs> always that it could do that. But I don't think that's why whoever is telling me why they're buying Bitcoin is buying Bitcoin or into Bitcoin. I'm sure there's altruistic people in some of them. I've been to the Bitcoin conference. Those fuckers want to make money. Like, it's no different than buying stocks or doing it. the 99.9. .9, I will go to my grave. They're just, can I make money in this? Well, and that's people, why I'm in it. Well, the people buying it. I mean, if that, if you're just simply looking for asset exposure, like obviously I think that's why I buy it. Like I'm right, not, but, I, I'm not trying to help Venezuelan people who I don't fucking know if it helps them. Great. <laughs> like, great. Like, I, good job, Dave. You help people you don't know, but I am, I'm looking at, no different than like a commodity, really. It's like, all right, I think this is going to go up. I do think there's a future in it. That's why I buy it. Why? What's the too big to fail? Because there, I think there's too much big money like behind it. Like I think too many people have big investments in it where it's like not just going to go away. But you don't understand why they do have big investments? I think a lot of the big investments have come after they think they can make money in it. But why? Why do you think they can make money? Because I they looked at it like, when it was going fucking nuts and how many people are talking about it and like more places accept it as payment and currency and things like that, where like you'll take big firms. I don't know the names, but you'll see big firms are like, we're never going to fucking touch Bitcoin. And then they're opening up like yeah. Bitcoin desks or like as part of their portfolios. So that to me was like, okay, there's more of that happening in more established companies are putting it on there on whatever it may be. But I've always think, a fundamental in this kind of goes to Bitcoin. The people who have the money are never going to relinquish money and power very easily. But from what I seem to see, people who had money and power were starting to embrace it. And that makes it a much safer place to be from in my mind. But, and you think there's no altruistic component? There may be for some people like the point zero 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 like one percent i don't think it's that small at I least for the people working i don't even think there's such a thing as altruistic act what okay there's a man who goes by the name of alex gladstein he's the chief strategy officer of the human rights foundation he works with activists all over the world who've been financially deplatformed uh financially suppressed for what you know pick pick your pick your reason why and he's introduced Bitcoin as an alternative financial rail for these people to uh, generate more money, to continue their activism and their fight in, in whatever form or function it exists. Not altruistic. Well, I have to know more about how do you know about it? How do we know about what? Alex, well, yeah. the HRF, the Human Rights Foundation? Yeah. Uh, we we met him through through Bitcoin. We're a big donor. I've donated a lot of money to Human Rights Foundation. See, but 
the the nature of why I say it also is say it does and you could argue this either way and I don't know enough about or like what it is but does if you do something because it makes you feel better about yourself and like you're getting a benefit out of it it's not truly altruistic I mean he, like so what are you trying to argue that humans are naturally self interested yes of course well, right all yeah I mean that's that's and hard. it's like I don't that's know hard how to argue against. yeah well I know but it's like how does if we weren't, we'd be extinct. You gotta make sure well, that's what I'm saying. Stay alive no, and reproduce. No, or functional I, I don't know like him. this guy enough, or like the publicity around it, or like people pat him on the back and be like, "You're a fucking hell of a dude, man." But but I I, <laughs> I, I want to challenge you, yeah. Because I've you'll sometimes <laughs> when we talk, you'll be like, "No, I get it. There's only 21 million of them. They can't be inflated. Scarcity and you know bar stools should." Once we're profitable, we should do what Elon but and Dorsey I think that, did. I think, but Elon like wasn't doing that for he was Elon was doing it to make money. Well, uh, of course. I mean, it's a it's a monetary instrument. If if any monetary instrument that just like, loses you money. If you told me, hey Dave, you can invest in fucking Apple and has a better chance to go up than Bitcoin, I would be like, all right, sign me up for Apple. What is your opinion on that though? Do you? Th what is your opinion on Bitcoin? Do you think I think Bitcoin's going to rip again at some point? Yeah, like yeah. more than Apple. What else do you invest in? How do you manage your P E N N? That's what I have. I have like <laughs> I have a lot of that right now. <laughs> yeah, so that I got diversified now that I'm able to. But I mean, I have a shit ton of pen. Do you talk about like it's probably public your position? Is it not? It is. People are morons. They don't know how to read. Like, what is your position size? I probably have. About forty million dollars in pen. Yeah, yeah. And you're gonna hold that position, you think? Not for no. I gotta diversify. I mean, it just got so like just for you example. Buy some Bitcoin. I I probably will buy some Bitcoin. I'm about where I'm at. I I'm That'd not. Boy. We're just on. I'm a Bitcoin guy. I'm just not <laughs> it because I'm like you know who's here the the human. I'm not. I'm Alice like Zoolander, like the Humans for Human Foundation or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's not why I'm. Buying it. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. I'm not going to turn this into Bitcoin. I know. I know that's what everyone wants. We'll talk about it. You got to understand it. I think I like I do. Right. The government regulates the dollar. They can fucking fuck with it. It can, you know, go out, and you can't do that with Bitcoin. I that part I understand. I think people in power and money will never like a lot of Bitcoin people say it's the new money. It's the new class. Like it's going to replace the dollar or something. People who have money and power will fight for that money and power to the death. So if they see something coming and what I, I said, I'm repeating myself. I've seen the people money power. I feel like rather than be like, fuck that, fuck that. They're starting to embrace it. And to me, that makes it a much safer investment than if, you still have the people money and power be like, fuck that. We want no part of it. And even like you've seen little things as much as people say Bitcoin's like it can't be touched. We've seen right stories with like regulation and government and stuff like that, where they, their tentacles start to seemingly creep into it. It's super simple. Um, the harder the money, the better it performs. And hard is in reference to how hard it is to create more of it. It's like a well-known quality of a money. So how hard is it to create another dollar? Very easy. Right, simple. Biden does not all the time. That's why the dollar is shit money. How hard is it to create another penthouse in New York City? Harder than the dollar, but not impossible. So real estate's a better investment than the dollar. How hard is it to create another Bitcoin? Impossible. And so that's why it's been the best performing asset and will continue to be is because it's the hardest money ever. And so like what I tell my high school buddies, my high school buddies are like, oh, it's down. It's not, I, like you fucking idiots. I told you guys about it when it was here. And then it goes here, 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 then it goes here. And you're going to bitch to me about a thing that was here and goes here and then we'll be there and go there. Yeah, well, that's the nature of. 
investment. But that's why points. that's why you buy and hold it is because it's the hardest. Listen, and it's I'm just like diamond a, hands in the fuck out of it. You didn't hear me complain when I was down to like 16 or 18 or whatever. I didn't. It was like and, well, the only time I, I was like, what is going on? Was when I was worried <laughs> the exchanges were falling apart. That's it. And uh the And I know you want me to not buy all the Bitcoin people. He's a fucking moron. He's not buying it with the keys and the dish and the dad. <laughs> I fucking know. I know. All right. I know. You should uh I have Bitcoins lost in the ether. They're a big would Barstool ever do like a Bitcoin finance? Because that's it's a big online community. Yeah, listen, we would, but also we think see things like I did the Barstool fund. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was all you could donate cash, cash, cash pomp it was like, <laughs> hey, you're not accepting fucking Bitcoin. You're not doing this. We put in a lot of work to make it so people could donate for, uh, with Bitcoin. Buckus. Yeah. Cool. It makes sense. How hard did you push it? I feel Pretty like fucking I hard. I feel like I didn't all your really altruistic motherfuckers <laughs> weren't so altruistic when it was time to donate and save some businesses. The people with fucking dollars were. I mean, no one would, you don't want to spend, you don't want to spend Bitcoin, man. Well, that's not very altruistic of these people. We're saving fucking businesses. No, the altruistic Bitcoin is altruistic because half the world is oppressed living under an authoritarian and they don't get bank accounts and they don't get to use money. And yeah. this is the only option they but have. But if you're it's sitting not there with all this Bitcoin and I'm saving all these mom and pop businesses during COVID, you think these same oppressed people who are like, I'm saving some fucking jungle and fucking Guatemala may help fucking Nancy's fucking dry cleaning down the road. If I'm rich and I have a million dollars of Bitcoin and a million dollars of cash, I'm, I'm spending the cash. cash. Yeah, well, I think there's a lot of other people. I mean, we heard, let me tell you, the Bitcoin people are loud. Like, let us donate That's why Bitcoin. I'm surprised that you guys don't appease to, like, a f why you don't have, like, a finance barstool arm that does podcasts for these people. Because they're the fucking crypto. They're like, crazy. Yeah. They're good online, too, which made me like them. Yeah. Good memes. Good, like, very yeah. creative. Great memes. Like, I, the Link Marines is actually when I got the, <laughs> that's when I got the paper hands. From, yeah. Because I bought and sold Link. And I was going to war with them like meme wars with me because i was a link marine for a brief time and that thing went down i'm like fuck the marines I paper hands making. pussy php yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so that was it but i enjoyed that like they're very good and I, I consider myself a bitcoin guy even if my intentions aren't to save fucking places i've never heard of yeah well no we'll take it we'll take you as a bitcoin guy we'll work on it we got plenty of time i think you should if you're going to diversify out of pen you should add to your position, I think. How so. much do you think a guy like me should have in Bitcoin? What What's a guy like you mean out of like how much are we managing money wise? Say you're managing 50 million. I personally, I. 100%. No, 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 no. <laughs> no. Only as much as uh, I don't need. I view Bitcoin as a savings technology. So if I need money to buy a house, pay my HOA, pay my mortgage, pay my phone bills, take Process my girlfriend payroll. nice places, that's working capital to live my life. Any non-working capital that I'm looking to save, all in Bitcoin. Yeah. That's it. So, no, but it's non-working. No, I know, but that your, your advice. So it's not you, 100%. But your advice that you just gave is... is People don't listen to DDTG. That's the same advice I would give for the stock market. Yeah. You're just saying put it all in Bitcoin as like when I was doing DDTG, do not put something in a stock that you don't have patience for, because if you have to sell it at gunpoint, you could get fucked. The only the only difference between me and the normal guy is the normal guy buy a little Bitcoin, a little bit of Apple shares, right, a little bit of Miami right. real estate and the Michael Saylor quote, uh, diversifying is just taking money away from the winner. If you know the winner, then what it like, you're a horse betting guy. What the fuck do I look like diversifying? No, 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 no. All right. That's why it was a dumb question I asked. It was a dumb question I knew the answer. <laughs> well, you should get more Bitcoin. Uh, I know you got a flight. Yes. This was great. Congrats, man. Thank Founded you. a business, ran it up to acquisition so that you could retire and then got it all back. That's the most legendary thing. It only makes sense to happen to Dave Portnoy. If it happened to another man, I wouldn't believe it, but I believe it's it. A crazy ride. Congrats. I think the four play pod said it best. They were like, what are, what are the odds of that happening? Someone said one in a billion. And I think it's one in any number. It, yeah. Yeah. It's bigger than a billion. It's it, one it, in, it, in every number. 
it's crazy. It's been a crazy ride. And then people are like, what would I've had a couple of people ask, like, what would Dave have told himself 20 years ago? It's like, just grab your nuts. You're not going to like believe the ride you're about to go on because it wasn't meant to be. Some people do business plans, VC. I just didn't want to hate my job. That's why I started this. So it's been fucking wild ride. No doubt. Congrats, man. Thanks. And thanks for coming on. And of course. Thanks, Dave. Yep.